This is African Pod Business Forum. And this episode is a thoughtful conversation about the risk companies face when they invest in other countries. My guest is Dr. Sam Lateral, a partner in the law firm Clifford Chance. He's an expert in international arbitration. It's a thoughtful and illuminating conversation. Sam, it's a pleasure to meet you here in your office uh, in Perth. What was the journey that got you onto the path of becoming a lawyer? Well, I was always interested in, in writing. I was good at English at school and I always found uh, reading and writing stories interesting. And law being um, a, a word game was something I was, I was attracted to. I uh, enjoyed uh, public speaking and that part of legal practice was attractive to me as well. So uh, when I was uh, finishing school, I um, was wise enough to listen to my parents and uh, go to law school rather than uh, pursue uh, a career as a landscape painter, which is, was the other thing that I wanted to do. Um, and uh, during uh, law school, I studied economic history and, um, and law. And through the study of, of economic history, I became very interested in, in early economic history, especially African history and trade patterns in Africa and in the Indian Ocean region. So the connections between Africa and Asia especially. And uh, law, I think, was a bit of a side interest for a while, but over, over time I became more interested in it as I studied it. And when I uh, finished uh, university, I, I um, joined a, a Perth firm and uh, started practicing construction arbitration, essentially. Uh, and then uh, through exposure to construction arbitration, domestic construction arbitrations, I, I um, had some exposure to international arbitration. And uh, I was then encouraged to uh, pursue a career in, in that field when that was quite a new field, at least in Australia, it was a new field. This is 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, I went and uh, I did a PhD and I um, taught at university for three years and uh, nothing, um, nothing causes you or requires you to learn like teaching. So I, I think I learned a lot about the law in that process and uh, when I finished my PhD, I, I joined a, um, a major Australian firm, uh, Allen's Arthur Robinson, as they then were, uh, to build up their international arbitration group. Uh, and and at, from, from that point, I was a, a sort of a full-time international arbitration lawyer. I spent some time uh, a few years in uh, Paris with Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer, which was fantastic. And then I was recruited by Clifford Chance to return to Perth and build up their um, energy and resources focused international arbitration practice. And today I'm a partner in, in, in that uh, practice area uh, in the office, uh, Perth office of Clifford Chance today. Clifford Chance is really the elite of the elites when it comes to uh, law firms. Uh, this must be your dream job. It's, it's great to have a, a, a big global uh, shiny platform like Clifford Chance. Uh, the, the Magic Circle law firms have slightly different footprints globally, but typically you know, roughly similar distributions. Uh, Clifford Chance is, is different in a lot of ways, but one of the things that makes us different, I, th I think, is we're very strong in the Asia Pacific, which is our neighborhood here, and we're also very strong in Africa. Uh, and it's really the Asia Pacific trade area and Africa that generate the, the matters that, that I work on. Uh, so I was, I, I was very attracted to Clifford Chance for, 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 for reason of its geographic strengths in those areas, uh, which are growing very quickly and are very important to, uh, to all uh, major global firms now. Uh, so, and Perth is uniquely positioned uh, looking west at Africa and north at Asia. That economic geography makes Perth a very favourable place to, to practice international arbitration uh, in, in the energy and resources sector. And when it comes to business, mm. it's thought that some of the qualities you need is good knowledge mm. about law, about mm. accountancy mm -hmm. and investment. Mm -hmm. How important is law? In that sense 
I think certainly some of the best business people that that I've encountered have have what I would say are very advanced general knowledge of, of law, even though they're not lawyers. So they're men and women who have have uh, either deliberately through a process of you know it's an autodidactic process of reading or, or or less deliberately through a sort of a combination of just paying attention to matters deals that they're working on and also spending a lot of time with lawyers they've acquired a good working knowledge of law uh, i think that makes them uh, very effective in the sense that they have the ability to uh, identify the, the legal components of a broader commercial strategy uh, before they become uh, perhaps key issues on which legal advice or representation is needed. So they they can see over the horizon a little bit uh, and that makes them probably more effective in strategic terms. I think you know, the, the ability to spot risk is is you know, legal knowledge as, as a, a basis for spotting risk, that's well understood. But I think people are perhaps somewhat less conscious of, of how legal knowledge and a good general knowledge of commercial law allows you to spot reward as well. Because, because the law isn't just about, about risk. It's actually about, about also about rewards and, and making sure that you know, rewards that are due to a business or a person um, uh, can be collected. So I think those that that commercial knowledge of law gives gives people a, a slightly different perspective on 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 a, on a transaction or an investment, and it's certainly very valuable in in the, in the marketplace to be generally knowledgeable about law. Now I'd just like you to re-emphasize what your expertise is because it's it's in a unique area, mm. and also to just explain how important your role is to businesses that are looking far afield in, in Africa, as an example. So, so I am an international arbitration lawyer, uh, but the kind of international arbitration that I do is, is um, it's arbitrations against governments, foreign governments, uh, under either um, bilateral investment treaties or free trade agreements or contracts. But it's actions between foreign investors and host governments. And, and that is a, a particular branch of international arbitration practice globally. Uh, a lot of it is, um, is, is taking place under the auspices of institutions like ICSID, which is the International Centre for Settlement of Investment Disputes, which is a World Bank um, body, independent body, but are under the World Bank auspices. And I, I do uh, uh, cases at ICSID and also uh, cases under other arbitration uh, rules and, and facilities, including the UN um, model rules, the UNCTAD trial arbitration rules. So there are cases against foreign governments. Uh, in, my, in my case, uh, my practice is, is focused on mining and oil and gas. Uh, but there are all manner of other uh, market areas or sectors that are um, users of, of this form of arbitration. So, so it's really about um, government facing um, matters. I also do a fair, um, a fair amount of advisory work. So, so what, that's really you know, the commercial or contractual applications of public international law because when you are uh, making a claim against a foreign state, you are making that claim in the broad legal framework of the law of nations or public international law. But that, that body, international law, also has application to contracts. When, when a foreign party uh, signs a contract with a, a government, uh, that contract is, is to, to, in varying degrees, subject to um, certain norms and principles and rules of, of international law. And so I advise on those uh, rules and principles uh, and the, the drafting of investor state contracts as well. And those international rules or a lot of international mm. laws can come across as being amorphous, mm. sometimes hard to define. That's right. And perhaps uh, parties that are supposed to abide by the rules mm. um, can just say, no, I'm not playing ball. Yeah, I think that the rules are amorphous, that international law is, is not centralised. Uh, so it's not, for example, uh, a body of law that's produced by a single parliament or national assembly in, in codified form, like written statutes. 
uh, international law does come in written form and the treaties and there are some very large international organisations and bodies such as the United Nations that sponsor or themselves produce written um, international law instruments. But there is a body of international law that's very important that is, that is, that is not centralised. It's not produced by uh, the efforts of any, any one state. It is, in fact, uh, a, essentially a body of custom and, and unwritten rules that are um, based or derived from um, a consensus amongst um, civilised nations. And those are rules that you and I and, and everyone who's watching this w would find um, uncontroversial. It's things like contracts must be kept, promises must be kept. Uh, if, if, if private property is expropriated, fair compensation must be paid. Uh, people must be uh, tried in accordance with principles of due process. Uh, these are the types of rules that we recognise as norms or principles of international law, even though they're not uh, recorded or codified in a in a treaty. So it, that body of, of of or that branch of international law is amorphous, but it is uh, still effective. The issue uh, that businesses encounter, and this goes to the second part of your question, the business the, the issue that businesses encounter is really enforcement. The problem is not so much that these rules don't exist. The problem is that um, businesses, uh, foreign investors, uh, don't necessarily have a forum uh, in which those rules can be enforced in circumstances where the defendant is a, a sovereign a nation. Uh, investment treaties and free trade agreements with investment chapters seek to address that problem uh, of, of forum, that forum problem, by providing foreign investors with access to uh, international arbitration as a, a means of resolving disputes with host governments. So the rules will include the rules written in the applicable treaty, but also generally uh, those unwritten or customary principles of international law that I, I've just described. And, and the difference is the treaty provides a, a clear and neutral uh, venue or forum in which those those rules can be uh, enforced uh, in a claim against the uh, host government. And, it, and in naturally the enforcement mechanisms are weak, would you say so? I think the, the investment treaty system, particularly the bilateral investment treaty system, so when you hear the, the acronym BIT, that's a bilateral investment treaty, there's about 3,000 of them uh, in force uh, around the world. And, and they cover essentially most countries. Uh, they provide for uh, this system of international arbitration or investor state arbitration that I'm describing. Not always, but generally they do. Uh, that system provides uh, the result of an international arbitration process under a BIT is, is an arbitral award that is, that is enforceable essentially as, as a court judgment in, in 150 or 160 countries under two large multilateral uh, enforcement uh, conventions. One is the New York Convention, which is widely used in commercial arbitration enforcement as well, and the other is the ICSID Convention, which is the specific convention that, that uh, governs arbitrations at the World Bank body I mentioned earlier, ICSID. So those, those treaties do provide uh, real teeth for the arbitration process. They make sure the product is enforceable and, and they are very effective. And indeed, it's because they are so effective that the system of investor state arbitration that was constructed really over the last 30 or 40 years is now coming under you know, public scrutiny and, and receiving quite a lot of criticism because it's, it's, it, it does work and, and governments are being held to account. Uh, there, is, there is an issue in enforcement which these treaties generally do not cover and that's sovereign immunity. So states have property, um, some forms of state property are immune. You cannot enforce an arbitral award against them and the classic example is consular property or defence property. Uh, but commercial property when it's owned by a government uh, can generally be um, the subject of an enforcement action in respect of one of these awards. So it does work, it takes time, and I think the most important thing to remember is that generally it's not necessary to seek uh, informal enforcement of these awards because governments tend to comply voluntarily. 
which is because you can't decide to go and arrest a government. No, you can't. You, 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 if, if, you, if you're seeking to enforce one of these awards, you, you need to think carefully about how to go about that and, and, and where to go about that. You need to know very, very well in advance where the respondent government has assets and then you need to identify within that, that group of states, you need to identify states uh, which have sovereign immunity laws that are, um, are sufficiently restrictive uh, to enable you to enforce the award uh, on their territory. But it, it, as I said, states tend to voluntarily comply. More often they will voluntarily comply than they will resist. Is that because they are incentivized by the fact that they might lose some sort of credibility that might affect their economic status or ability to play within the global economic stage? Yes, I think that's right. I think the world's a small place. Um, smaller every day and and uh, governments uh, understand that uh, in order to participate uh, with in the international you know the global economy uh, they need to uh, maintain a, a good reputation including a reputation for um, respect for the international rule of law the the issue governments encounter uh, when they don't abide by foreign arbitral awards is is that they will uh, eventually uh, have to uh, deal with the problem of their sovereign risk uh, being increased. The perception becomes that they are a riskier bet uh, than other countries that do comply with awards and that do respect the inter- international rule of law. So that what really happens eventually is that their non-compliance with a major arbitral award will drive up their borrowing costs on international um, debt markets. So Which in the long term becomes more expensive. Eventually it does, and it depends. Some, the, the ICSID system has a particular relation to the World Bank um, finance system, uh, and so non-compliance with an ICSID award may, uh, may have that effect f- sooner than uh, non-compliance with another form of, of arbitral award. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the, net, the net effect is the same. It's the, the sovereign risk rating of, of that state uh, is, 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 is reflecting its non-compliance with the award. It, it is perceived as a more risky proposition and it becomes more expensive for that state to um, borrow money on international markets. Bond yields, things like that go up. Yeah. You know, I'm just imagining that anyone listening to you, watching you right now will be thinking, well, your head is just full of so <laughs> many complex information that is specific to this specialized field. What significant risk do companies actually face when they go you know, investing in other countries where the host country uh, chooses at some point, perhaps due to many different reasons, chooses not to play by the rules? What is the level of risk companies face? I think the the level of sovereign risk that uh, that a company faces when it invests in in a foreign country, uh, you, there, there will always be a variation depending on the the, the country concerned. So each. So that is part one of the thoughtful conversation. Part two is live online, in audio and video. Subscribe now to African Port Business Forum, and enjoy it all.